All right, you're welcome along to the football show. We'll keep you up to date with all the latest scores as the show goes on. But I'm delighted to be joined in studio by the man of the match from last Sunday's FAI Cup final, Roberto Lopez of Shamrock Rovers. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Very good, I'd imagine. Yes, yes. It's been a it's been a great few days now. Obviously celebrating the the cup final, and um, yeah, I'm just kind of get, recovering and still taking <laughs> it all in at the moment. Maybe. Recovering from the match or recovering from the celebrations? Uh, recovering from the match, obviously. It was a, <laughs> we went the extra time and it, was, it took a big toll on the body. And obviously there was some great celebrations after the game and and the day after and and the day after that league. So it's it had it had been a while since Shamrock Rovers had won a cup. It was incredible, uh, just how long considering the storied history of the club. And one way or another, it was going to be a momentous day. Whether it was a first cup win in 32 years for Rovers or whether it was going to be Dundalk winning the treble. And then it was such a dramatic day. Did that add to the sense of just absolute exhaustion at the full-time whistle? Not the, even the fact that it went extra time penalties, but the way you probably had in your head you had that cup final one, I presume. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. It's the emotion that you go through on the on the day. Obviously, it's the build-up towards them. Like, we got up for me, me breakfast and I like, feel the butterflies start and then so... If you go through that, going through the warm up, taking in the atmosphere. The did you stay at home the night before? Or did you go to a hotel? We're in a, we stayed in Carton House, yeah. So um, we woke up there and went for our breakfast in, in the hotel. You could feel the butterfly starting then, and you're travelling to the to the stadium on the bus, and then you, you see the atmosphere when you get in there and train at the national anthem, and then you're actually playing the game. Obviously, you're so focused and then in, in the game and trying to do your job right and trying to win the game for your team, and then the jubilation of scoring a really a last minute goal. Mm. Only to be cancelled out by a last second goal. It's just it, it's a roller coaster, and then to go through the extra time and then the penalties, um, it does take a ton of your body. But I'm just so happy that we came out on the right side of it. My sense in the stadium when Michael Duffy scored that goal with literally the last kick of the game was that everybody, almost the Dundalk fans as well, were just shell shocked because it felt as though the game was done. It felt as though the penalty was going to be the match winner. For you as a player standing inches away from it happening. What were your thoughts as you saw it nestle in the back of the net? Yeah, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Like obviously, um, like you said, we we don't we've got the, the last minute penalty. You think that would be enough? But like you know, in this game, you can't switch off. And uh, a player like Michael Duffy has so much quality. You give him half a sniff in the game, and he'll punish you. And he did. Like and it was literally just a, a moment of brilliance from him because the ball could have dropped anywhere in the box. He was on it like a light, and it's a really great finish. Um, but I think. When the game finished, we kind of spoke amongst ourselves. I just remember Joey saying, "Look, lads, we're all shocked. Let's not, let's not like dress it up like it happened. Let's go on with it. The next five, ten minutes are important." And I thought we managed the first half extra mm. time really well because it was a real hammer blow. After you think the jubilation, we're going to win the first cup in 32 years, and then for that to happen, so I thought we managed the first half extra time really well, dug in there, and then started to build ourselves up again. And the time the penalties came round, I thought we we're a lot more confident than we were. Probably finishing again. Would that be normal that Joey O'Brien would be the one who'd stand up in moments of difficulty and say the right thing at the right time? Yeah, like that's just Joey down to a T. He's uh, he's seen it all. He's been been there, done that, and he's just got really great experience. And he wasn't the only one who said words because there's, there's a few leaders in the team. But uh, throughout the season, yeah, any hard times they've been through, Joey always has something to say that's uh, that's constructive and that would help us. Because like I say, he's been through it and he's just fantastic. Have something like that in the team. Are you the sort of player who can enjoy a day like that? That mid-match you can almost look around and take in the surroundings and appreciate where you've got to in your career, or does it all pass in the blur? Yeah, it all pass in the blur. Yeah, I I couldn't enjoy it. I said I had to watch the game back yesterday because I didn't know how we played. I wasn't sure if we played well or not. It was just because you're mm. so involved and then you're so concentrated on your job. Um, and even looking back in the videos of the the match and the atmosphere in the stadium, it was brilliant because as you say, you see it when you come in there. But you kind of block it out as soon as you, the whistle blows because you know you need to be concentrating fully here. Was that the first time you played at the Aviva? Yeah, it's the first time I played at the Aviva and it was incredible. I did, and you don't realise how big the pitch is until you, you step foot on it because obviously it looks big in the mm. TV, but then you get down there on pitch level and, and it's massive. Um, but How no, do you prepare yourself for that then? Um, you, just, you try to do everything properly that you would do in a normal match day, so you don't want to, to change too much. So, um, like even that week up to train, it was the exact same. Where we'd have our heavy days and light days, our days off. We tried to keep everything the same, keep the same routine. My match day routine was pretty similar in terms of what time I go for breakfast, what time I, I ate at, and just me pre-match preparation. So you try to keep everything the same, and, and obviously try and play a normal game. And 
happened. You hear of managers sometimes for these big occasions that they rehearse absolutely everything down to the two teams lining up and somebody will play the role of the imaginary president two days in advance so that everybody can get themselves mentally prepared for what it'll be like for that long build-up because it is a longer build-up to kick off. You've been out on the pitch for probably 10, 12 minutes rather than just getting straight into it. Had you done some work around that? Yeah, I think uh, what we've done and what was really important was say, um, the week before the week of the cup final, we actually went to the Aviva Stadium on Thursday just to kind of see the dressing room and see the pitch and just kind of take it all in. So it wouldn't be a shock to us when we mm. got there in the day. That was really beneficial for us. And again, no, it was just it was about um, keeping everything the same in terms of our routine and obviously not trying to get caught up in the occasion of it and focus on the match. And I think all the all the tactics for that really paid off and it worked. Yeah, I think. The general view would have been that Shamrock Rovers were deserved winners, that they were the better team for the vast majority of the game and controlled the game. Jack Byrne had a lot of great moments and probably created the most interesting moments in the game. When you watched it back, did you think, you know what, on Cup Final Day we delivered, we did what we wanted to do? Yeah, definitely. As I say, when I was playing the game, I, I didn't know how we were playing because you're just so in focus on your individual battles going all over the park and obviously just trying to help your teammates show. But when I watched it back, it was actually a really enjoyable game. And I hope uh, people in the stadium and, and the neutrals thought that as well. I really enjoyed watching the game back. I and mean, we did play a lot better than I thought, you would, thought we did. And uh, we had a fair few chances as well. It could have been one or two up in the first half. I think Green had a great chance off Jack Bourne's uh, ball as well. Like, so, yeah, I was, I was very pleased with the performance. And like you said, I think we were deserved winners in the end. You mentioned that the pitch at the Aviva is quite a bit bigger than probably what you're used to out in Tala. Did that, how did that work as a centre-half? Did it change the way you had to play? Um, <laughs> it took me a bit longer to look to the halfway line, I suppose, and, and, and keeping the high line. But um, no, like, I think um, it was the same for both teams. So um, if we found it hard, I'm sure the dog found it hard. And uh, it's just about uh, managing it on the day. And luckily we have a great centre-half in, in Lee on one side, Joey on the other side and Big Al behind us. So between the four of us, we've been able to manage the back line and obviously sp communicate to the rest of the teammates. You got the Man of the Match award and people have been talking about you all season, I think, as to how good you've been at the heart of that Shamrock Rovers defence. What is your background? Like The obvious thing I'm sure that's brought up all the time is Roberto Lopez isn't a very Irish name. I'm, I'm wary of saying that in a, in a modern Ireland yeah. where we're going to have an awful lot of people yeah. with Dublin accents that uh, don't have names that we would associate with traditional Dublin people. But what, what's your background? Yeah, no, um, my father's from Cape Bear Islands. Um, as I think a lot of people have got to know the last few weeks, um, my mum is Irish. We grew up in Crumlin. I live in Crumlin all my life. And yeah, I started playing football with Lord Celtic. Uh, that was my first club and left them, I think, when I was 13 and joined Home Farm. I played them for three years and then in my final year of school boy I was on to Belvedere and then obviously played for Bowles for a good number of years before moving to Rovers and yeah, here I am now. Yeah, the move from Bowles to Rovers, controversial one at the best of times. Yeah, I think... Is that something you still hear about? Uh, not so much anymore because I think there's a few players that have moved between the clubs since like but whenever someone moves from either Bowes to Rovers or mm. Rovers to Bowes, it's always controversial. You're always going to get a bit of stick and you'd expect nothing else because it's a massive rivalry in the country. Mm. Like So, uh, yeah, it, it got a bit of stick at the time. It, it, I don't think anyone's too bothered with it now like, because it's how just players have moved in between. And Bowes used to always beat you for a good while as well until <laughs> the last time. Yeah, so exactly, yeah. They so didn't like, mind that much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So bragging rights might change now yeah. after cause we got the, the better done in the last two games. Like, so, um Next season would be interesting to see what response you get. And what was it like growing up in Dublin uh, with the name Roberto Lopez? Did everyone just accept it for what it was? Yeah, obviously you get questions. See, no, see nobody calls you Roberto, so that's kind of great as well. Like, uh, everyone calls me Pico. And more the question is, where does Pico come from? Where does Pico come from? <laughs> uh, that's Nick, my nickname. Obviously, right. my dad gave me that when I was younger. Um, I couldn't tell you what it means, but everyone calls me Pico. My family calls me Pico. Teachers, friends, everyone used to call me Pico. So that obviously started the conversation of, oh yeah, who gave you that? And yeah. me, obviously, my dad and dad's from Cape Verde Island. So that's where I stand from telling the story. The Cape Verde Islands, as you say, people I think have become aware of it because. There was actually, I think, five senior internationals playing for Shamrock Rovers, players who played at uh, senior international level, and you were one of them because you're now playing for the Cape Verde Islands. Yeah. I was, was that something because of your heritage with your dad, you were always very aware of as an option? I wouldn't say I was aware of as an option. Like, um, I think when I was with Bowles at the time, Aim Ben Mahan got called up into the Tunisia squad, and I was kind of joking, oh, I can't wait for my call up to the Cape Verde mm. squad. And I uh, kind of looked into it a little bit there, but never really pursued with any real intent. 
and then I remember getting a, a message on LinkedIn, believe it or not, uh, just to like connected with the manager and I looked at the profile, his Cape Radio manager and his, his history and all that and I got a message just in Portuguese which I thought was like a welcome message or, or spam so I just took no notice of it and that was this time maybe last year, probably October last year Right. and then um, a few weeks ago, then a few, few weeks before the squad was announced, uh, he wrote to me again in English to see if I thought about the last message and I was like, well, what's going on here? So I, I translated it and it turns out they were looking at getting new people in the squad and I was asked would I be interested in, the, in declaring. So I went back with my tail between my legs, apologised and goes, look, I'm really sorry, I don't understand Portuguese, I just translated the message there. I'd love to be involved if it's not too late and lucky enough I wasn't too late and the ball goes, got rolling from there. I sent all the documentation that I needed and lucky enough I was, I was picked in the squad and I got a great experience playing against Togo and against Marseille and it was brilliant. What sort of level are Cape Verde at? It's very good. I have to say the quality there, like given the players who are all over Europe and all over the world, it was really high standard and even the games, two games were, were fantastic to play in. It was very like a, a European game. So um, it was very tough, very high quality, but uh, it was just great to be a part of it. Yeah. Had they been to see you play? I'm not too sure. I think they they seen videos. Okay. Um, yeah, there's plenty of videos. And the, the goalkeeper plays for AEL Limassol, and we played at Pollen Limassol as well. So yeah. um, I'm sure there was some reports being trans transferred between each other. And what was the reaction after you made your debut? It was, it was crazy because obviously it, like, it was a bit daunting going in yeah. to, the, to the group at first because everyone speaks Creole and I didn't know who sp spoke English. But once you start training, it was grand, like football is its own language. And then the match day itself, obviously a bit nervous, so I was, wanted to do well. Um, and after the game, it just all hit me. I was like, "Jesus, I'm not to, not to make the international debut." And I had, had everyone text me, all the family text me, mum and dad, so proud. Like, so it was brilliant, and it was it was great to share that joy with them. Yeah, and I guess you don't want to stop there either, because Cape Verde play in the well, will be attempting to qualify for the African Cup of Nations. Playing Cameroon they're next playing, month, is it? Yeah, later this month. Later this month, yeah, they're playing Cameroon and Mozambique. Yeah, so yeah, ho hopefully. When there's do you find out if you're in? Um, I'm not too sure. I think the squad was announced today. Like I'm not in the in the squad, so um, I wish them all the best. Like yeah. I, I hopefully down the road, like uh, the call to come again. Yeah, exactly. But I, I, I'm thrilled at my experience that I had. Like it was unbelievable. Yeah, a, an international manager on LinkedIn is something quite unusual. Yeah, I thought that's why I, I didn't expect not, not the message at first because yeah. I didn't know if it was just a welcome message or uh, a bit of spam. Like because you say it, it's it's very unheard of. What are the ambitions then? Because the way of the League of Ireland is, even though as much as it's improving, even the conversations around Jack Byrne are going back across to England again. Do you think you can fulfil your ambitions at Shamrock Rovers or is part of everybody almost in every League of Ireland squad thinking, you know what, if I can get over to England, get the chance over there, I'll take it with both hands? Yeah, well, at, at the moment I'm, I'm fully focused on Shamrock Rovers mm. and uh, after winning the FA Cup, we've set our sights on, on the league and obviously getting closer to the dock and that's been a big ambition of mine for, for years to, to win the league in the League of Ireland. And I say, I've, I love the league, I love the energy, I love the intensity, I love just the, the backing it gets from the fans. And so uh, I'm just looking forward to next season. Yeah, Stephen Bradley was making the point straight afterwards that you need to prove to yourselves, you need to prove to everybody, you can win these trophies, you need to actually go and do it. And Shamrock Rovers have done that, Dundalk have done it consistently through the years. There probably is going to be quite a bit of pressure on next season now because of the resources that Shamrock Rovers have, because of the fan base that's there, the history. There'll be an expectation that it won't be an 11-point gap. I think it was, was it up in 17 points when Dundalk actually won the league and, and were crowned league champions. I, and you'd expect the club are going to try and kick on again in terms of the transfer market that you'll be having going into next season very much with title ambitions. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the way it has to be. As I say, we've been made a statement now by getting our, our mm. first cup and probably beating Dundalk in a, in a, in a big game like for a long time in the world. Um, but like that's the that's the pressure you expect to be at a big club by Sean McRobbers and it's a pressure that we've been putting on ourselves as well because we want to win it as players first and foremost, win a league. I, I haven't won a league yet so it's a big ambition of mine like I said and uh, for the fans as well it'd be great just to continue to grow and close the gap in Dundalk and hopefully overtake them. What's Stephen Bradley's philosophy when you're in training is there a, a certain brand of football that he's very keen to ram home constantly uh, yeah he wants us to play football and um, he has great visions and uh, he's a very intelligent man the way he sees the game and the way he interprets it to every player it's fantastic and he's a great man to work mm. under he makes you he may he'll make you a better player um, but yeah he tries us to, to play the ball 
ground on the ground <laughs> and uh, just to trust each other because he's brought some great players to the club and uh, we need to, to use them and use our strengths. You're obviously training every day with Jack Byrne, who's been in and around the, the Ireland senior squad and has, has made his international debut. And listen, I think everyone's very aware of his technical abilities and there's very few players anywhere who demand the ball and can do so much with the ball. From being around him every day, just how good, good is he? Oh, he's incredible. Incredible. Like his ability is, I don't think I've seen better. He sees things that no one else sees and then he pulls them off as well, which is, mm. which is incredible. Uh, but even off the pitch, Jack is just a massive influence in the dressing room. He's the most loyalist man I've ever met. So much energy. He could come in with half a head in him and he's still the loudest man uh, in the dressing room. And it's great for morale and obviously team building and bonding. And he's doing his, his business on the pitch as well. He's not just kind of here for the laugh. He's yeah. went from the pitch training. He's fully committed, fully focused. And like you said, it's stuff he produces in matches. We're seeing it week in, week out in training. And it's unbelievable. Because I do wonder about that dynamic. It was noticeable when he came on against Bulgaria. Straight away shouting at the centre-backs, giving the ball and not to have been going long. And being like that, and that, like that's his way, and that's the way he wants to be. He always wants to get in the football. When he came back in and he arrived at Shamrock Rovers for the first time, and he's like that with G as centre-backs and your more experienced players, is, is that an easy transition? Does it take a bit of time to get used to that sort of personality? Yeah, I suppose, yeah, a little bit. Just obviously getting to know each other's ability, but very early on you're seeing what Jack had, like, so... You'd want to give him the ball. You mm. want your best players on the ball at the end of the day. So if Jack's coming demanding the ball, you're going to give it to him because he'll make me look like a better player and he'll probably deliver the pass that'll win us the game. Like So uh, it didn't take too hard to get used to, as I say. He showed what he could do in training early doors and we're trying to get him on the ball as much as we can in games all the time. Shamrock Rovers, obviously, it feels as though it's very much heading places. Dermot Desmond, that has been announced in recent weeks, is going to make an investment. There's a, a very strong academy there. Like Tallis Stadium is probably the best stadium that any club has in the League of Ireland in, in terms of facilities. Do you get that buzz as a group as well that this is a, a club going places? Yeah, definitely. And since I came in, um, I've been here three years now, and the strides that the club has made going forward, it, it's incredible. Like Even look at the first team squad, the academy teams, and the, as you say, the facilities. Like It's going from strength to strength. I think it was very important to, to win that on Sunday mm. as well, just to kind of say, because like, trophies are important as part of that development. Um, but yeah, I think if you're at Rovers at the moment, you've got to be looking forward to what's ahead, like, and obviously kicking on and all the news and all the, the positivity that's coming out of the club, but looking forward to it. When you're in that dressing room, and you, like, you mentioned Joey O'Brien earlier, like, it, it, you almost need to remind yourself when you're watching Joey O'Brien, it's not that long ago he was playing at the very highest level and not getting the odd game. Like, he had many seasons at West Ham where he was very much first choice centre half. Do you tap into that? Have you spoken to him about that and and what you need to play at that level? Yeah, like it, it, it's crazy. Like it's, you, you just kind of ask him about stories, like like who was best player you played with, like uh, who just fell on the team. Like we when I went away, we played Marseille and Poya was was playing for Marseille, and I was back to talking to Joey. He's like, oh, how's he? How's Poya and all that? Like, I, and then he'd tell the stories about him and training. Like, um, yeah, but you, you, don't, you don't forget because Joey shows his quality day in day out, and over the, this season. He's been top class for us, so consistent, and uh, I don't think I don't think you affect. You, sorry, I don't think you can forget that he played that level because mm. you see the the quality performance he puts in week in week out this year. You can see why he's played at that level. Like so, it's incredible to have him there. What do you think you need then over the close season and heading into pre-season to be able to bridge that gap to Dundalk? Because with the European money, they're not going to stand still either. They're going to go out and they're going to try and reinforce and they're going to have the ability to go and spend some money. When you're looking at the group, when you're talking, I don't know if you plan a, an, an end-of-season debrief so that she can probably kick on for the start of next season. What are the areas where you really feel you just didn't get there this season that saw Dundalk win the league? Uh, look, like obviously, that's kind of important. The manager to plan ahead, like um, me and myself, I think we, there was a few games, obviously, the games against Dundalk and games against Combos that we didn't really pick up points in as well as probably maybe a draw against mm. Derry and I think it was, uh, it was Sligo down as well. They probably points this season where we really should have been picking up points and we're probably looking at in the games where we, where we could have done better and then where we could have won the game and probably should have took points uh, back with us. Um, Is that a mental thing? When, particularly the fact that look, the Docker are a very good team, obviously, but the bohemian side of things, do you look at it and think you put too much stock almost in those games? Uh, no, because some of the performance I thought we performed really well and it. it was just a matter of when we're on top, it's scoring the goal and finding a way to win, as I say. And that's us as a group of players. We need to find ways to win if we want to be uh, successful going forward. Um, and, and the most important thing as well, actually, is probably keeping 
to go to the squad together and then maybe add one or two just to keep the quality up and the competition there. And you have you look at the likes of Neil Ferrugia, who's coming back mm. from injury and only played a handful of games, he looks like a real real talent. Like So I'm looking forward to seeing Neil with a full uh, pre-season under him and really attack the start of the season. Do you get much time off now ahead of pre-season? Because it is a long winter break, it always feels, in the League of Ireland. Yeah, no, I'd say we, we'd be off for like a month or so, and then we'd normally be in the gym for the off-season, uh, working with Darren Dillon, the strength and conditioning coach, mm. and do some good stuff there. And then I think, like most clubs, we'll be back on the pitch in uh, in January when the hard work starts again. When do the celebrations finish? Um, I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know if they ever finish. They go all the way to Christmas, I'd say, anyways. Yeah, exactly. Hopefully they get Where have Christmas you been over the last few days? We were up in the, the Aberley Court and uh, the Terran you're in on Monday, just obviously bring the cup round to the fans. And mm. we, we got a great turnout, to be fair, and it was brilliant. Then we went on to the Temple Bar, and that was that for the night. <laughs> How much of an awareness is there amongst the players of, I guess, the the building, the brand of the club in, in South Dublin? It's club base in Tala, but its history is all over, well, all over Dublin, but also particularly all over South Dublin, like you're talking about going to places like Terran Yard that aren't that far from Tala, but trying to tap into that sort of crowd to increase the attendances. Yeah, it, I think um, if you didn't have a sense of before, beforehand, you definitely did after Monday. As I say, going to the Aberley and meeting all the fans coming up to you, shaking their hands, and thanking you so much, it's, it's incredible. And you're hearing their stories of how long they've waited and from when the times in Milltown they used to go watch games and all that stuff. And then the same in Terran, you're again meeting all fans and it's just brilliant hearing their stories and how, how long they've tra- uh, supported Rovers and where they've been, where they've travelled and how they were longing for this cup. Like, so it was fantastic to kind of give that back to them as well because they've waited so long and they're so loyal to the club. Yeah, Roberto, it's been brilliant to have you in the studio. Enjoy the celebrations. Thanks very much, Nathan.